Hello and welcome to Movie Menu Classics, your go-to podcast for classic cinema. Here are your hosts, me, Heather McLean. And hi, I'm Basti. Welcome. Um, each episode, we're going to talk about some classic films that we personally love, that we've either recommended to each other or we both have seen. And we're, of course, going to recommend them to you because we love them. And we're going to discuss um, fun facts about the films and this is a great opportunity for you to either learn some fun things and discuss a film you already love or to experiment with classic films. If you're new to classic films, um, maybe they seem boring or daunting. We want to let you know that we think they're really fun and they, there's a lot of movies that still really hold up and we want to share our love of classic film. So for this week, we each... Um recommended a film that the other person hadn't seen before so I recommended Cabaret uh, to Heather who hasn't seen the film and it was released in February of 1972 directed by the famous Bob Fosse screenplay by Jay Allen based on the play by Christopher Isherwood um, and quick little fun fact I've never seen the Broadway play so <laughs> all of my feelings for this is only based on the film so the plot is a female uh, entertainer in the Weimar Republic um, is about the the romance of the era in Berlin while the Nazi party rises to power around them starring Liza Minnelli Michael York and Joel Gray you can stream this on Amazon and HBO Max. Uh, and if you have any other places that you know that it's uh, streaming now, feel free to um, reach out to the Movie Menu Podcast and let us know. So Heather, before I give my biased opinions on this film, <laughs> what did you think? So I um, had no idea what this film was about. I've obviously heard of the movie Cabaret. It's a pretty famous movie musical and Broadway show, which I've never seen the show either. So I went in to this uh, completely uninformed and I made sure not to watch any trailers. And let me tell you, this was not what I was expecting at all. Like <laughs> at all. I don't know what I was expecting. I was not <laughs> expecting this. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I really, really, really enjoyed it. This is an art piece film. Um, it's it's very complex and complicated like this is the kind of movie you need to watch a couple times to really get a, a good grasp of all the different concepts there's um it's it's really artistic storytelling because it's not um such a direct narrative like for something like we talked about in the last episode we talked about um it's a wonderful life it's a very simple movie in the sense that it's easy to follow you don't need it to know any history you can just, you know, be introduced to the world of the film and it's um, an easy story to follow. There's nothing to try to really figure out. Right. You can just watch the story. But this movie, um, it's so complex. There's, you know, it's, it's discussing so many different themes like, like sexuality and love and different types of relationships. And then, um, you know, and then the basic storyline is you're, you're watching this um, happy-go-lucky girl who's um, just, you know, loving life and she has a dream and she definitely has some, some issues <laughs> that she's working through for herself and her self-confidence and her identity. But, you know, there's this, what you think is like a simple story, but then there's also the backdrop of you know, Nazi Germany forming around them. And it's fascinating to watch it. It's, it's in the background. It's subtle, which is really poetic for how it actually happened in Germany. You know, you, the, people didn't really notice it was coming. It took a long time for the Nazi party to come into power. Nobody took them seriously. 
laughed and, at them. Just kind yeah, of, yeah, laughed at them and, and you know, thought they were actually wrote stuff down. There was, there was all this propaganda they were spreading and people were starting to believe it. But, you know, no one's taking them seriously and there's a lot of complacency around them and they're just like, oh, they're just going to go away or they're not going to, there's no way they're going to take me, you know. Exactly. Uh, they're not going to take power. So it's really interesting to watch that all happening in the background in such an artistic way. And then, you know, the third a po- um, component of this is is the musical aspect of it because you know she Eliza Minnelli's character works at a cabaret and so the only musical numbers that happen are actually like stage performances but they're narrative performances in a lot of ways and they're also um I had to write words down because <laughs> I had to like write my thoughts down on this oh but there's just so much like symbolism yeah. in like not just like the characters and what they're feeling because that happens a lot um you know like Liza Minnelli is singing a song and is really telling of what her character is going through emotionally in her storyline but the rest of the performances are like these satirical narrative stories about what's happening in the world like very symbolically and so there's so much to take in and I really need to watch this movie a few times because it was almost overwhelming yeah. like I was I remember when it ended I was like had to sit with it for a while so I'm sorry yeah. that was very long-winded but I really no, enjoyed oh my the God. film <laughs> this is exactly so. what we're doing I was hoping you were gonna like it um personally I first came across this film in college I believe it was through TCM uh Turner Classic Movies and I had heard of the film but I only knew of Liza Minnelli, the kind of like the cartoonish figure. I didn't really know her performances or her art or anything other than she's Vicente Minnelli and Judy Garland's daughter. That's Mm -hmm. kind of all I knew before watching this film. And then, so I was a history major in college. So once I read what it was about, I'm like, oh, maybe. And I like musical musicals, um, but I do have a special love for like the non-musical musicals a little more just because it doesn't quite take you out of the story sometimes. And I know some people that don't like musicals, that's the biggest problem is like suddenly you're walking down the street and then you break into songs like, uh, it's not realistic, but. Yeah, you really have to have a suspension of disbelief to go along with it. And this film, I believe, transcends that. Because you're right, it is, all the musical numbers are on stage, and you can kind of dissect it, make up your own mind as to what's going on in the story. Um, I didn't know how many Oscar nominations and wins this took at the time of watching it. But after I was I shocked, it, yes. After watching it, I'm like, oh my God, I love this film. Um, and it was right around the time when it got re-released on, on DVD. So this is our 03. And upon reading how many, so it, it won Best Picture. Oh, I'm sorry. It won Best Director. It won Best Actress uh, for Liza Minnelli, which um, I think she had to defend herself about being ac- accused of nepotism because she's basically, you know, MGM royalty. But I think she earned it 100%. Uh, Best Supporting Actor for Joel Grey, which I, another well-deserved um, win. Best Cinematography, Best Editing, Best Production Design, Best Sound Mixing, Best Original Song, and it did lose Best Picture um, to The Godfather. So I think that's okay that it lost to The Godfather. <laughs> it's kind of like if you lost to, you know, if you're a sports fan, if you lose to the Chicago Bulls, like, you lost to the Bulls, like you at least lost to the best. <laughs> um, I believe it still holds the records for most nominations and wins without winning the best picture. Um, wow. So I, I think it took everything that The Godfather didn't win and there you go. So uh, maybe that's a little more incentive for those who haven't seen The Godfather yet. Um, this film was entirely filmed in Germany um, and I believe some of the interior shots were filmed in Munich at a, at a studio but everything else was in Berlin um, wow, I had no idea that's really cool upon researching for the 
uh, for the film, Liza, she says she only, of the 1930s, she only knew of like Marlena Dietrich. Like, so she wanted to actually go blonde. And her dad said, uh, there's, there's other looks, you know? <laughs> um, so she kept her black hair. She cut it herself. She got eyelash extensions. Um, that like haircut. Her- can we, can we pause <laughs> and talk about that haircut in this movie? So it's, I mean, she has a really cute kind of um, curl on the side of her face, yeah. which is very reminiscent very of Betty like the, Boop. yeah, Betty Boop. I yeah. was just thinking that, or like, you know, like twenties and thirties, mm-hmm. the, the cute short girl haircuts, but her bangs form like a heart. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's like, it is a heart around her eyes and the point comes down in between her eyebrows to like the bridge of her nose. And it was it was cute, but also distracting for me personally. I was, I, I couldn't decide. I kept changing my mind about how I felt about this haircut throughout the film. And I don't well, know it, why. It, it accentuates her eyes and her eyes are already very striking. Um, yes. Almost a little cartoony in a way. And I think that just, um, it really brought out how animated, how almost unreal her character was. Like she's very you know, doesn't care about what's going on in the world. She's all she cares about, you know, sex, having fun, doing drugs and living that, that flapper life. Um, Yeah. She's larger than life. Absolutely. Um, She, and she's so, yeah, you're right. She's so fun loving. And I like, I love the, the sexuality that's explored in this film. Um, yeah, especially because- being set in the thirties. This was, I think took place in 31, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it was just interesting. Go ahead. So Germany is coming off of, you know, the trauma of the first world, losing the first world war. So everything about, I know people tend to think about Paris in the 1920s, but like, think about what Berlin was doing in the 30s of like sexual freedom, um, drag, bisexuality, you know, you know polyamory every, you could anything you could think of that was berlin in the 30s that was like the place to be for that type of expression and freedom so it's it's weird to to think about how how freeing how how open it was when most of our first thoughts when it comes to you know wartime germany is you know, Nazi Germany and order and nothing was allowed and all the awful things that, that came with that republic. Um, yeah, these so people like, were partying hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, they were partying very hard. That's where you would want to, that's where you wanted to be, to to be what you, you probably couldn't be at home and so you got a lot of expats. Um, something I read, because I haven't seen the Broadway, um, the Broadway performance, which it's not that I'm against it. I just, LA doesn't have the best Broadway scene. So shows come here for like two weeks and then they're gone. It's not like New York or London where they're there for a very long time. But um, I was reading that a huge difference in between the film and, and the Broadway show is that Sally is British on stage and she's American oh. in, in the film. Um, so I don't know how that translates. Um, if there's some, you know, Broadway buffs out there that, or purists, I should say, um, who don't like this interpretation of the film. Um, and I think a couple of songs got cut. But speaking of songs, I mean, some of my personal favorites are, you know, the opening, Vilka Men, Mein Hair, Two Ladies, which completely explores the the sexual freedoms um, that people were experiencing. One of the most frightening moments in cinema that I've experienced, and I know this is gonna sound really cheesy to some, but the performance of Tomorrow Belongs to Me is just, it gives me goosebumps every single time because to me, that song just completely exemplifies how evil can prevail right beneath our noses. Like it's That's just, when they're, they're, the, the boy is singing that in the, yes. like at the picnic, right? Yes. Yes. I love that scene. 
for so many reasons and just just seeing how horrifying, how scary it is to see everyone kind of like one by one join in. It wasn't all at once. It wasn't this like storming the, you know, the capital. It was a very gradual rise to power. And to me, I mean, little known or little known fact maybe for, for people in the States, that song was cut during the release, its initial release in West Berlin uh, or in West Germany. Um, and it wasn't added back until I want to say well into the 80s, which is bizarre to me. Because um, I think that's one of the most memorable parts of the film and to not have that, I don't know if how that would change the film. And yeah, it's such an interesting, so that scene, I don't want to give too much away for um, people who haven't seen the film, but it's such an interesting juxtaposition because it's such a, it's, it's a cheerful song. It's a happy song. And it starts off with a, a, you know, just a sweet, innocent boy, like a young teenage boy singing this song. And then and it's so the the feel of the scene is so happy and it's you know it's a beautiful day and everyone's outside and then it slowly you know the camera um i don't even know the word like undooms from his face i can't think of the word but we're panning out we're yeah. seeing more of the scene um and the the imagery is so it's chilling to me like I yeah think it's so different than the tone of the song but then there's also like this is it, it's it's such a metaphor for how the nazi party infiltrated the people because because no one's really reacting to what's happening like we're just seeing it, it's it's interesting and it's not it's not a you know a violent scene or anything it's not shocking but it is it is you're right chilling is a good word because it's the realization of like how oh, much things have changing. been infiltrated yes 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 and that's the interesting thing about the film like i said that the you're watching the the nazi party kind of um creep in in the background and you know it's interesting because it's not fo the film doesn't focus on it it's not focused on it at all it's just this little reminders little hints and, it, and it's like a a a snowball rolling downhill and it's getting bigger and bigger and it's th this film is very artistic and very interesting you can have long discussions about it it's it's not a, a simple film but it's it's beautifully done and it's fun and it's interesting but then it's also really dark it's, it's a, so dark and I yeah it's heavy the unfortunate thing about this film i mean it came out in a very turbulent time and I think just over the years, I think it's just one of those films that's going to always hold up just because it keeps happening. History keeps repeating itself in different ways. Absolutely. But I it, think it's it, very relevant to today's times as well. Just um, complacency and not, not paying thinking, attention. You know, as long as, as long as it doesn't affect me well, you know, and mm -hmm. it's that complacency that's so dangerous. Um, did you know that this film, while rated PG in the States, it was actually X-rated in the UK? That Which, makes more sense. It's yeah. rated, what, what did you say it's rated? What? PG. How is this film rated PG? Just, okay, your background behind you. And for those of you who are just <laughs> listening, this is a, an image, her, like her, her background is an image of, of just a little snapshot from a scene on the cabaret stage. And there's you know, half naked ladies. It's like a burlesque show. It's a cabaret. Um, just that alone, this movie should not be rated PG. Um, but there is a lot of sex and a lot of, I mean, not that you're watching like an act of. No, it's just a discussion of. They discuss it openly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you, you're discussing um, like polyamory and cross-dressing and, and it's, it's and then like just the darkness of there's there's there is some graphic violence and there's some really dark things in this movie and dark topics and and real how is this rated PG? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I think that yeah, it was a very different time in the world in the 1970s, but 
I'm shocked too that it was rated PG. Like, what? <laughs> um, yeah. I was not expecting, and this is not like, uh, I mean, as much as the film feels really fun, it's it's very, very dark. And that's another like juxtaposition. We're like, we're having such a good time. We're singing, we're dancing, we're drinking. Or just- yeah, but then like, the it's the, but- the uh, conversations here are very heavy and very intense. Um, wow. All right. You got me with that one. The rating on the film. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. okay. I am, I would be curious to hear from the gay community as to where this film stands because I've read that it's like really important in in queer cinema and how Liza became like this icon. Um, so I would love to hear from from listeners that have any knowledge of of where the film uh, stands in in culture and I think you know with it being Pride Month it would be really interesting to to know um, some of those opinions and as well if you haven't seen it I think it's I would say don't watch the trailer because I watched the trailer you know today for the first time and I love the movie I own the movie but um, I probably wouldn't have seen it based on the trailer which uh, it's, it's interesting so I think Go in it as blind as you can, besides everything that you know that we've shared about it. Um, Heather, what would you what would you say? Yeah, I, I think that the trailer is really long, for one thing. And yeah. I remember we, we watched it together, and you said that it gave a lot away. I kind of agree. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, just getting kind of a feel for the, the aesthetic of the film um maybe you know you knowing that going in and like when it's set that's fine but yeah just just uh enjoy it like keep an open mind and let's see see what happens when you watch it like no preconceived notions that was really interesting for me because I didn't know what ride I was going on and it was a very interesting ride um did you know that Joel Gray the host of the cabaret is the father of Jennifer Gray who played she's she's famous for being baby and dirty dancing and um Jeannie and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yes, 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 yes. I forgot her name. I was going to say um, the, the sister in Ferris <laughs> Both correct. Yes. Um, but I had no idea. Um, and he's he was fantastic in this. Joel Gray did a fantastic job. My goodness. He deserved he was, that Oscar. Everyone who won their, their Oscar nominations deserved it. Um, the only other one that lost besides Best Picture was Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, eh, whatever. But everything else, yeah. Um, everything else took the took the award. I was surprised to know that I because I'm not super. Um, I don't have the best memory when it comes to best pictures off the top of my head, unless it's like a film I'm like really crazy about. Um, so I didn't know this lost to The Godfather that they both came out in the same year and. Uh, I get it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, you know what I noticed? I, I so I haven't spent a lot of time with Liza Minnelli as a mm-hmm. as an actress. I haven't seen her do a lot, honestly. Um, especially not a lot of singing. Yeah. Um, you know, I know who she is. I know about her, but I'm more. I'm a. I'm a big Judy Garland fan. Oh. Okay. And it was it was adorable for me how much she sounds like her mom. She she really yeah. has such a nice Judy Car uh, Judy Carlin Judy Carlin um, quality to her voice and it was kind of sweet it was, it was reminiscent of her this is definitely not a film that her mother would have performed in <laughs> in her career but um, yeah that was is really sweet do you have any yeah, other I, fun I facts love, um what was your one of your what was a memorable song for you. Um, that's tough. I, you know, and I don't really know the names of the songs, honestly. Um, but I I really did enjoy the music. There wasn't necessarily a song in particular that stuck out. Again, I really want to rewatch this film because it's all, I was so focused on trying to get the themes and understand and, and really pay attention to the symbolism 
And there were some moments where I was like, what is happening right now? And I had to kind of figure it out and really analyze it later. So, but right. the music's definitely fun. And just even that opening number, it really sets the, the stage for what you're in for and in the, the aesthetic sense, the feel of the film. So I definitely enjoyed the first number and then um, more of like her her solo performances uh-huh. when she's singing. It was a, a fun insight into what her character was feeling. Um, and then like the group, it, just, it was all really good music, honestly. Uh, I'm glad, yeah, I, I can't recommend it enough, especially right now. Um, I mean, again, it's unfortunate that this film's always going to be a little bit topical in one degree or another, but with so many people, you know, kind of at home watching new, new things, still not being able to go back to work, I would highly recommend watching Cabaret just to, if not for the idea of how easy it is or evil to just kind of become part of life if you don't do anything about it. Um, and I think that's that's where I'll leave it at that. All right. That's definitely something to think about. (laughs) So moving on to a very, very different film, like (laughs) night and day, completely different feel, (laughs) but interestingly enough, set about the same time. Um, Yeah, right. So the the movie I recommended to Vasti was The Glenn Miller Story. Um, It was released December 10th, 1953. It's rated G. It was directed by Anthony Mann. The screenplay was by Valentine Davies and Oscar Brodney. Um, Here's the plot. So it's a biopic about Glenn Miller, who is played by Jimmy Stewart. Um, He's a poor trombone player with dreams of fame. Eventually, through years of hard work and determination, he's able to start his own band, and they become one of the most successful groups of the big band era. Is starring um, Jimmy. I can't call him James Stewart. I can't do He's it. Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> yes. All right. So starring Jimmy Stewart and June Allison. Um, you can stream this movie from. I so I watched it on Amazon Prime. It was three ninety nine. I watched actually, it on Apple TV. Uh, just I guess Apple uh, for three ninety nine as well. Um. All right. So there's a couple options to check it out. Um. So, I guess, what do you think? What'd you think? What'd you think? I didn't know a thing about this film, which as I was watching it, I was thinking, number one, I'm a huge Jimmy Stewart fan. How did I miss this? I'm a huge World War II fan. How did I miss it? I'm not a fan, but you know, of the work. And I love big band. I love musicals. I love big band era stuff. How did I miss this? I just missed it. I can't get hung up on it. Um, there's a lot of movies out there, so I can't judge myself too harsh. It's just one of those, like, how did I not know about this? Why didn't anyone tell me? Well, I'm glad <laughs> you told me, Heather. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I will immediately, just seeing how some of it was set in LA, I'm like, oh my God, it's an LA story. I love it. Um, not entirely, but I, I did love that it was also a non-musical musical. It was, I was a little nervous. I'm like, wait, is, I would have heard if Jimmy Stewart would have sang in this, this, right? I know June Allison's a dancer. So I was actually, um, she was, she played a role that I wasn't quite expecting, but I loved it. It was just, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a, a real life George Bailey situation, but a happier mm-hmm. one in, you know, failing, trying to pursue what you love, taking risks, which is, you know, especially in times of need, is really hard to do because you want that guaranteed paycheck. And for him to take that leap at such an uncertain time financially, especially for a traveling musician, is so admirable. Um, I'm not a musician. I don't, I never studied music. But I feel like you don't have to be a musician to appreciate this story. I mean, I think if you play in a band, you'll appreciate it more. But I enjoyed everything about it. There are so many songs. I'm like, oh, that's Glenn Miller. 
Um, in the Mood, Moonlight Ser Serenade, Pennsylvania 65,000. Those are the ones I knew by name. Um, mm -hmm. Others that, I'm like, oh, oh, I know that one. I kind of hum it, but I think that's what this film is full of. It's just, oh, I know that. I know that one. And it's just, a, it's a, it's such a lovely love story to, about two people, about a man and the love of his country wanting to keep morale up, wanting to, you know, just change things up. It's, it's been told, but I still love it. I love a good underdog film. And I, I didn't know anything about his life. So it was nice to see the, um, his life kind of unfold. I don't know what is actually accurate. I know biopics take their liberties sometimes. I haven't checked what, what actually um, transpired versus how it was interpreted in the film. But I would say it's, it was a lovely Sunday afternoon film to just like be taken back and also just realize that you can, you can change and influence the world even if it's something not so direct as being a politician. You know, I, I, I keep saying George Bailey because we just talked about that film last week and it's James Stewart. So the, the Yeah, I never I never thought about the the similarities between those mm -hmm. movies at all. And I, I mean I'm a Jimmy Stewart was definitely typecast in so many films because he was just such a, a lovely every man's man. I mean he's just such a charming relatable actor on screen so he's he's a lot of these films he's the same character a little different but it, we just we love him and we want to see it over and over again so yeah I was watching it especially like the the first scene between him and Allison or June Allison um when when he's talking about his dreams and it was just like it was George Bailey all over again and it was a beautiful moment and so I, you just you love him but it's and you're rooting for him you know and I think what I what I personally what what came out while I was watching this was as he's about to you know take that risk to build his own band the practical part of me is like well I understand the other bandmate not wanting to go for it because he has a steady paycheck mm -hmm. um but sometimes you just have to go big and it's it's a classic very relatable tale because we've all whether we've actually taken those plunges or not we've all been there and we can you know it's never too late to do that but it's a good reminder of I just love hearing those stories of just people that just risk it all yeah, the, the difference the difference between George Bailey's story and Glenn Miller's story is that they both had a dream and they had big plans and they knew and he even says it's almost an identical line. I know exactly what I'm gonna do. Um yes, but George when I saw I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it I was like, wow, this is it's one yeah. that I fall over again. Um but so George Bailey, you know, he had to make so many sacrifices and he never did get to follow the a dream he had. But Glenn Miller, through through the love of his life, who was so supportive, and she, you know, at least, I don't know how, again, I don't know how realistic it is, but yeah. in the film, she's just so smart and thrifty and, and understands him so well. Like, she's, she's always three steps ahead of him. Yeah. It's like, he'll get an idea, and she's already had it, and she he's already planned for it and it's just such a sweet relationship and love story it's just you're rooting for them you love them they're just the sweetest couple and it's yeah, such a I great love, love, I love story watching how it unraveled how his life unraveled not knowing anything about him which I'm still kind of in disbelief myself just because I'm such a nerd for those kind of things I would um but I found him fascinating, and I would love to read a biography on him, actually. Uh, Definitely. But yeah, you don't have to be, like, the, the biggest big band fan. You just It's just a nice film. It's a gorgeous love story, and it's a very, it's a good kind of patriotic film. Um, it's not, it, it wasn't propaganda. It was just, 
a man who loves his country and I appreciated that so much yeah. I think at the end of the day we all do you know Absolutely. we all want to do our best to make this a, a better living situation what it's currently right now for yeah. some people um so no it was just a very uplifting idea overall and i would absolutely it's worth the four dollars <laughs> for sure <laughs> I, I know, mean, I, know a, I said it last week, but I'm like, I definitely spend more on like games. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. This, so. And the, I, so I watched this movie. I had to have been the first time I remember watching this movie and falling in love with this movie is my parents introduced it to me. I was probably seven or eight and oh, huh. I fell in love with, of course, Jimmy Stewart's character and their love story, but it was more the music. I fell in love with the music big band this jazz swing era and I've just I've had a love affair with it ever since um it's it is a genre that I listen to like you know my Pandora station I was playing in the background I'm doing something yeah. a lot of times it is big band because I just love it so much and I actually I haven't seen this movie in years in yeah. years and I re-watched it so we could discuss this and I was getting emotional every time yeah. a song would start there's that you know he in the beginning of the film, he's talking about trying to find that new sound, that new sound, because he's, you know, he's a magician, a magician. Oh my goodness. Listen to me. No, talk. I mean, he kind of is. <laughs> yeah, right. He's, <laughs> he's, a mu <laughs> <laughs> he's a musician and he's, you know, he's playing in, in, in these jazz clubs and like anywhere he can get work. He's playing in, in orchestras or like, you know, playing for stage shows and they need a, a live band whatever it is he's working he's working he's poor um he's just a trombone player wherever but he's he's got this this drive to find a new sound that he doesn't know what it is and the scene where they discover it I mean I had chills and I was getting emotional and then um you know that song starts and you know the song and it's so familiar and you're going if you didn't know it was a glenn miller song you're like oh, you yeah it's that, that one yeah right it's such a familiar you've you've all heard it every person has heard this in the the soundtrack of movie after movie after movie um like these songs have just resonated for generations or i guess two generations it's only been so long since <laughs> so um the so he was a recording artist from 1939 to 1942 and I'm going to read these facts that I, I looked up um so he, it says he was the best-selling recording artist from 1939 to 1942 leading one of the best-known big bands um Miller's recordings include like the famous songs like you mentioned in the mood Moonlight Serenade Pennsylvania 65,000 Chattanooga Choo Choo String of Pearls Tuxedo Junction the list goes on um, in just that four years, Glenn Miller scored 16 number one records and 69 top 10 hits. That's insane. That More insane. than Elvis Presley, who had 38 top 10s, and the Beatles, who had 33 top 10 top 10s in their careers. Like he outdid in just those them. Four years. In four years. Yeah, that's, that's insane. insane. I also looked up, um, I didn't know that the soundtrack was number one in 1954 um, yeah it was, that's the only um oscar that it won actually was for sound recording i believe and nominated for best screenplay and score i i think i wrote down um i didn't know that june allison and jimmy stewart were a pair like they were paired in several films yeah, this was the second. I saw that too. I didn't. I didn't know that because I haven't seen the other two films. I haven't but, either. I'm like, wait, what? Oh, I right. <laughs> and they're so cute together. They're so cute together. I saw that the second of three movies where Jimmy Stewart and June Allison play husband and wife, and the other two are Strategic Air Command and The Stratton Story. And honestly, I've never heard of either of those movies, but I kind of want to check them out now yeah, because exactly. <laughs> they're really cute together. Um. Did you know that one of Glenn Miller's trombones is on display at the National Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio? I did not um, know that. 
yeah that's pretty cool right oh and in in this movie he mentions to his father in 1940 um that's when that scene takes place he tells his father that they they have sold 800,000 records and they get three cents a piece for each record which came to like $24,000 right do you know what that'd be equivalent to today what's in play yeah yeah tell me $393,600 $393,600 for one record <laughs> for one record right and they had Amazing. 16 of them so he was doing very well he was well <laughs> That's amazing. And he went from poor, he was so poor, he was having to constantly hawk his tromb- trombone to get some money and then have to take it out of the pawn shop to, uh, he did pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so good on you, Glenn Miller. Yeah, um, I'd say anyone and- interested in watching this, don't read up on him until you watch this. Just go into this com- as blind as you can. Um, yeah. I, I didn't realize it was uh, like an oh my gosh moment you know you you I know you had you told me that you had a a moment during this film where you were shocked yeah and um so if you look in the Glenn Miller beforehand you're not gonna you get spoiler alert don't read the synopsis don't don't do anything just just hit buy or rent and just enjoy it enjoy the music oh and I guess um so Jimmy Stewart took trombone lessons to to prepare for this film so he looked more realistic mimicking playing the trombone I'm like it kind of looks like he's playing it like it's not just you know Judy Garland just kind of moving her hands on a piano yeah um, no so he tried to learn right yeah. but apparently it went so horribly wrong <laughs> um, that the like the the teacher then the music instructor just like gave up on him <laughs> <laughs> just like That's no that it was described as like such horrible noises that were coming out of that trombone <laughs> um so it was it was not actually him playing it um but he at least could correctly mimic the movements of you right. know what a trombone player would be playing because it looked really realistic to me i thought so i mean well again this is coming from a non-musician but i uh, you can kind of t- you know we talked about Kaylee Mills in the Parent Trap, where she's how is she playing an electric guitar on an acoustic guitar and just doing this? That wasn't Jimmy Stewart. He was actually chilling. Yeah, it was, he was accurately, as this says, it was like he was accurately miming the movements of a yeah. trombonist. I don't know if that's the correct word, but I'm gonna go with it. Trom- Musicians, be be kind to us. Yes, and if you know. <laughs> What we're actually supposed to be saying, yes, please <laughs> let us know in the comments. <laughs> um, so I just, I love this movie. It's a really fun, fun movie, even though it's a little bit of a tearjerker, honestly. Um, and not just for me, who's, you know, was having a nostalgia trip when I'm watching this movie. But um, it's just, it's such a sweet story. And the music is just so wonderful. If you're at all fond of the swing era music, you'll love it. Um, also, shout out to uh, Louis Armstrong for his cameo. Yes, really I cool. loved it. And I love how June Allison's like, who's that? And Jimmy Stewart looks at her and he's like, with this know. look of like, <laughs> duh, on his face. He's like, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> it was a really cool moment because... We're like, hey, it's Louis Armstrong. Like, it's just really awesome. Um, yeah, there's yeah. that meme going around of Leo DiCaprio, like, pointing. when That was me. I'm like, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> so what did you think about the trailer? We watched this trailer beforehand. What would you think? So completely opposite of what I thought of the cabaret trailer. Watching the, the Glenn Miller story trailer, I'm like, oh, I would have watched it. Like that would have influenced me to to have watched the the film. Um, so I mean, my final thoughts between the two, or uh, about the two, is both World War II films. One definitely dealing about the environment. One dealing with just wanting to change the morale in the country in the U.S. I think they're just two very fascinated story for any World War II buffs out there. You don't have to like musicals. You could just watch this film, enjoy the music for what it is. 
without, you know, it, it's not trying to convert you into being a fan of musicals, I don't think. Yeah, I don't, I don't really consider it a musical. It just has so much music in it. Yes. It's, it's very much like um, A Star is Born, like the newest one, or Bohemian Rhapsody or other things, or, oh, or Walk no. the Line, where there's musical numbers. And there's not really much singing in this either. It's just orchestra. Um, but it, there's a lot of music, so I feel like it sort of still fits under a musical genre. Um, before we finish up, I want to make a couple corrections because I misspoke on the last episode when we spoke about It's a Wonderful Life. And simple things, but I want to make sure my facts are correct. I was corrected after the fact by a listener, so I want to get it right. So Drew Barrymore, I, or I mentioned that Lionel Barrymore is, is related to Drew Barrymore. I said it was her grandfather, but actually it's her great uncle. There's a whole line of Barrymores, like generations of Barrymores that have been actors. Um, like her, her grandparents and parents were actually actors, but the most famous of which of her relatives is Lionel Barrymore. So a great uncle. And then also we I were talking it, to ab- be fair. I thought it was her grandfather too. Yeah. So, it's so I misconception. It's common, I think yeah. it's a common mistake. But I was corrected by my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she listened to it and she's like, you know, it's his uncle or her uncle. I'm like, oh. Sorry. Good job, mom. Um, Yes, good job. (laughs) I looked it up and I was like, oh. All right. And then also we were talking about the, this is really basic, but you know, facts. I believe in facts. Um, We were talking about the colorized version. And again, I don't believe in colorizing black and white films. Neither was Jimmy Stewart. That's true. Very true. (laughs) Um, But we talked about the Mr. Gower's drugstore and how the the advertisements and and memorabilia in the store would have been from the 40s but actually the only times we're in the store is 1919 because he's 12 and And then he he, yeah it's like 10 years later so it would have been 29 so just to be accurate i just had to throw that in there anyway do you have any uh final thoughts about the two films we discussed um Anyone still on the fence about Cabaret, watch it with a remembering that this was released in the early 70s when so much of, there was so much censorship, which I, which is why I think I was so surprised that it won as many Oscars as it did, just because I don't think of the Academy recognizing something so controversial. Um, yeah, and again, I don't understand how it's rated PG. Um, I yeah, I I'm gonna watch it again with that in mind too. Like PG, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> I feel like they were much stricter. Like you said, they they were there's a lot of censorship. Like yeah, I don't know. It's fascinating. Okay. It's so <laughs> fascinating, and I um I like that we pick these two films. They're, they're just such opposites in terms opposite um attempts in a in an era that's very close I mean one's the beginning of the war one's the end of the war uh I found that fascinating and I liked watching and discussing the two films even though I wouldn't think of them together in a discussion normally uh if that makes sense yeah they're 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 complete opposite films um and like you said they're about the same era but there are definitely different stories for sure and different uh (laughs) different conversations um okay so i really 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 want to recommend a specific movie so i picked the theme for our next recommendations and i would love to go with rom-com all righty so what do you think what movie are you going to recommend roman holiday Okay. Yes. I haven't seen it. I don't really know anything about it. Don't. <laughs> Just watch it. Okay. <laughs> I'll go into it blind. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I am going to recommend my favorite rom-com of all time, and it's going to be It Happened One Night. <gasps> I've been wanting to watch that because it's always on, like, every best picture list, and there's so many of those early best pictures I haven't seen. 
that being one of them i know one of the famous scenes with yeah yeah, yeah. all right i'll save it for okay our next yeah discussion. it's it all is right. i i will say just basic is that it is the the grandfather of romantic comedies i can't wait i'm really excited about that one I'm glad. I'm so yeah, glad. Yeah. And, but it is it is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like it, it was the first, like when we made a list, this was the first movie that went on to it. Roman Holiday was mine. <laughs> it, like, awesome. <laughs> literally, yeah. Uh, and I know, yeah. I mean, you have to be my friend for like two seconds and then you'll you'll know how much I love Roman Holiday. <laughs> all right. So I'm, I'm really excited um, for our movies. So we're going to check it out. We're going to watch both the films. And the next time we're going to discuss them in depth like we did here today. So thank you so much for joining us. Vasti, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. So if you want to also watch it with us. Um, so um, be prepared for next time just to have any additional thoughts. If you want to chime in with it happened one night and Roman holiday. Um, Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Be sure to make, check out the website at moviemenupodcasts, with an S at the end, dot com, all one word. Um, until next time, I can't wait. Thanks, guys.